Welcome to Insight, produced in partnership with KLCS in Los Angeles. Today we are chatting with Bob Smiland, President and CEO of Inner City Arts. Bob has generously agreed to share some of his experience with us. I'd like to thank you, Bob, for joining us today. My pleasure, look forward to it. Art, the inner city, students, young people, public schools, talk about the role of city, inner city arts in advancing education and bringing art to students. Big question. I think the primary answer we like to share is safety. That when you provide the experience of, of learning and enjoying art, it provides the individual student or a collective group of students that feeling of, of safety to be themselves, express their voice, no matter what their background or who they are. It's such an interesting answer. Safety, safety meaning it's, it, it's, it's not necessarily physical safety, it's emotional safety. It's the ability to not ha actually have to fit within a framework that's defined for you. You're given freedom. There's no mistakes in art. Uh, our founder, Bob Bates, 30 years ago, uh, uh, reminds us of that every day. And so when students come to our campus or we go to a school site, uh, it is the uh, emotional safety for sure. And our approach is extraordinarily non-judgmental in that regard. But it's also in our beautiful campus located in Skid Row here, uh, it is a very safe place. And we're aware that most of our students come to us from difficult home lives or, or backgrounds and, and you never know what happened that morning. And that's why we provide uh, food and safety uh, as they become relaxed and, and enjoy the arts. And it, it changes who they are. How do you train the people who provide the services that you provide to students? How do you prepare them for this philosophy. And one thought before that too, the, the opportunity we have uh, with our nine art studios is that students, even as early as kindergarten and first grade, can explore various forms of art. So they may find visual arts, music, theater, performing arts, computers, media arts, they find their own groove. And that's an important part of the process. Uh, we do believe the process is K through 12, its entire stream. Um, our approach, like others in town, is complementary to the work done in the schools by credential arts teachers. We believe it's an essential teamwork uh, with the public school systems and the uh, nonprofits who operate under artists who teach, uh, generally called teaching artists. And uh, in our case, for example, we allowed uh, many paid days off per year for the artists to continue their inspiration of their personal art to bring that inspiration back to their, their instruction in their studio. So we, we believe that. Uh, the approach by artists who have that passion for their form of art is what they share with the students. You have a social good mission, but you also run as a corporate entity. What is your budget? How many people um, are employed and how are they employed? And talk a little bit about your physicals. Happy to. Um, Inner City Arts is a budget of $5 million. Um, sadly, 95% uh, contributed revenue. We, we raise that every year from zero. We have a, a small endowment, but I've never made that effort. Uh, so we're grateful for a little bit of public support, uh, uh, not much from the federal government, increasing a little bit from the state government, city and county, and then uh, we have a good relationship with the school district to some degree on the funding side of things, but that's challenging. Um, so we have to raise 95% of our, of our budget every year. and we're, we're grateful for that, but it is not a um, strong model for long-term sustainability. So we're currently working to increase our earned revenue to find other ways of increasing our, our revenue. So scale comparative to challenge, you have a very small entity um, in comparison to the entity you ran. Do you feel like the challenge is as great as the... Uh, as the <laughs> so the most difficult job I've had in my life. Uh, I, I, I talk about that with my board. You know, my, my own company, my largest board I ever had was five. Uh, here I've got 35 and uh, dedicated people. They're wonderful, but uh, it's just more work. Um, but the, the, the fundraising aspect and, and the, um, is much more difficult than creating a, a product line or a service that you can do more research on in the marketing and know the price point and the distribution channel and so forth. So it's, it's remarkably challenging. We employ right about 60 people, almost all uh, full-time staff. Uh, on top of that, we have, uh, I think, 15 or 20 independent contractors for um, spot projects. Um, it's been my goal that I've not yet achieved to not only radically increase the pay, um, breaking the nonprofit scarcity, I'm poor model to uh, a, a good paying job uh, with reasonable benefits and some sort of retirement. And um, it's uh, been frustrating to me that I have not been able in six years to achieve that goal. Uh, it certainly drives me every day when I get to work is to, these people work so hard, they're dedicated, but 
you know, uh, it's not the kind of job that people enter for the income. Doesn't it say something about our society in terms of who we reward and how much we reward them uh, uh, based on uh, criterion that, don't, that do not necessarily connect to the health of our civil society and, and to the health of our children? Um, the people who work for you are engaged on a personal basis in strengthening children, yet they're paid a pittance. It's just backward, and I hope it changes. Um, one thing we're trying to do on a positive side in our high school program, we have a very strong career program we call Work of Art. And it's dedicated to helping students find a love of art that will create a really good career uh, in the creative economy. We're not uh, working with electricians or plumbers anything at this point, but uh, we are graduating kids with a very high graduation rate and a, a success rate getting into externships and into jobs. Whether they choose to go to college or not is, is not important in this case. But there are some very high paying jobs in Los Angeles that uh, come out of the arts. And, and our internal goal is that those born here can live here for the rest of their life, not be forced out. And creation has become much more uh, broadly embraced in different fields. Um, what, we're, what we're seeing is as the US economy shifts and the uh, search for new solutions become ever more important to our vitality, that connection to the creative process of being able to find new rules and new paths that connect to your original point and be able to constantly strive to uh, go into places that have not yet been explored. That is actually what you're doing and you're doing it through initially sort of the, the, the fun, creative, hands-on work, but that also uh, carries through someone's life sure as they does. graduate. And even with the, the radical increase in technology we use all the time in our life, uh, we still start, especially at the early ages, with the fundamentals of drawing and art and sketching and color and line, shape, and form, example, um, and, and that leads to success in the use of technology. Uh, we don't jump right in with teaching you know, software. Video, video gaming uh, development big, and so big on Big industry, so all that. Big we, industry. We, big uh, industry. Our, our most popular high school classes now are uh, related to video game development, coding, mm -hmm. uh, fashion design, very popular. Our, our graphic design program is sold out by, we, we more demand than supply every session. There's kids that really enjoying that and they find a, find a career. Now you're a numbers guy. You could not have run the business and grown the business that you did without knowing what constituted success and be able to demonstrate that. And now you're in a situation where you're making that case to foundations and other funders, to school districts. Talk about the numbers of your success. Well, um, very challenging question because uh, uh, my, my staff would, would uh, uh, we joke, I'd say that, that I speak in numbers, they speak in, in art and speak in narrative. But every discussion comes down to a budget and in our, our uh, cooperative narrative now, every line item of a budget tells a story. Mm -hmm. and, and as we learn to work together on that, we are now understanding the, the flow of a budget line item to know how that tells a story about the growth of the program, growth of enrollment, depth of the program, compensation for our staff, all the things eventually are told through the numbers. And your budget is your investment capital. You want to ensure that you're getting the maximal return in terms of impact for every child. Yeah, boy, and that is a uh, true, and that's a data-based uh, challenge for us because we, we can measure students and our, our adult students at certain times, but the uh, later in, uh, in measurement is more difficult. Yes. We, we don't know quite where those students are one, two, three years out, and we want to have long-term impact. We believe we do. But we, uh, we certainly are, are pretty proficient at measuring the impact as a student leaves our campus for the first session or first year. So one of the things that, that we all have to be sensitive to, because we all sit in our different chairs and we all have our different experiences, the person who is in a foundation, who is a program officer, who is considering uh, funding, needs to also consider, although their request for data might be full of merit and good intention, it needs to be seen within the context of the operations of the organizations that they're funding and with a full understanding that part of their money is simply going to go to reporting to themselves. So keeping a light touch is really important for you. No question. Uh, uh, the local uh, group of funders in town at Los Angeles have uh, worked together to have uh, uh, sort of consolidated applications and we had a discussion recently about consolidated reporting uh, and that would make sense. Um, we would, uh, would simplify things for audit. It's more difficult in a, um, 
computer online report to tell your story, but uh, we'll work through that. Consolidated application would be something similar to the common application that certain colleges exactly. use. It would reduce, if you think about this as a workflow, it re reduces the overhead for everyone. Right. And it also um, allows for uh, a higher um, quality of information because uh, time can be spent uh, creating that information as opposed to changing the format right. from uh, and, and changing the little details from foundation to foundation to foundation. Two of those briefly that, that fascinate me are, are backroom uh, consolidation efforts. And there are many of us in, in town who, you know, not every nonprofit needs its own finance team, its own IT team, and, and there's some of that happening which is positive. The other is um, uh, pooled resources and, and, uh, and consolidation. There are 30,000 nonprofits in Los Angeles, I am told, and uh, um, we are working toward attempted merger and acquisition. For example, uh, board, ego board participation. When you, if you have two boards, you need to cut them both in half. That's uh, that's tough. It is because they care so much. It's they love the institutions, and uh, and then um, certain you know, uh, tr uh, tradition with founders. It's trickier, uh, but it's fun. It's a fun thing for us to try to work on. In terms of of your future, we had talked about uh, contributed revenue. You had referred very briefly to earned income. Um, and, and the fact that your contributed revenue um, and the grants that you receive uh, dominate, but you need to rebalance over the next years. How do you see that evolving uh, when uh, many of the people that you serve have no ability to actually write uh, a check or... or, or, or yeah, well, yeah, we have zero uh, contributed revenue from 10,000 parents. That's not our community. Um, uh, one, Easy example on earned revenue. Our campus is lovely and beautiful. We're open seven days a week from early in the morning to late at night. We're not open Sunday. So film rentals on Sunday would be a phenomenal earned revenue source for our campus. Uh, we are now exploring and, and had our first experience with social enterprise where student produced work can produce revenue which can be shared with both the student and the nonprofit. Uh, we studied a group in Boston uh, who does, does this regularly for many years, and we think that's a trend. And for example, a, a collection of art um, will be leased or sold to a law firm or a county firm downtown, and instead of having uh, some other form of art on their walls, they'd have student art. Mm -hmm. and there's great interest in that, and that could be a revenue source. Uh, our media arts team, graphic design team, can produce a web page now for a small company who needs a web page, and, and uh, we're moving in that direction. Making the world a better place making the world a happier place, introducing art into the lives of so many people and helping them to think of themselves as creators, as empowered people to shape their own future. Bob Smilin, thank you so much for my, sharing the story of my, Inner City My Arts. pleasure, so I enjoyed the dialogue. And thank you so thank much you. for your insights. My pleasure.